Hello everyone, welcome back to Talking History. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you're all keeping well. Um, before we get into the video, I would just like to say that there wasn't a video last week because I made the decision to not upload a video out of respect for the loss of our Queen. Whether you're in England, whether you're American, Australia, where wherever you are in the whole world, it's made an impact because she has been someone who has been there for so long most of us know no different me at the age of 39 i don't know any different she's always been there she's always been a constant i was only talking to my dad the other day at the age of 73 he also hasn't known any any different she's reigned for the whole time he's been alive so for all of us, whether you're a royalist or not, whether you like the royal family or not, it's, it's made an impact. And I personally like the royal family. I have so much respect for the Queen. I, I think she's done amazingly well to reign for so long. And I know things are so much different to the time period we're talking about, but it's still... A massive achievement and I think Charles will do really well uh, granted he's got some massive shoes to fill but both the Queen and Prince Philip raised him well and knew what's to be expected as for William and Catherine but I will say the one thing for me it's Princess Anne. She has never left her mum's side, right from the moment she passed away in Balmoral, right up until going into Westminster Abbey. She never left her side, and seeing that shows the amount of respect and love she had for her mum. And uh, I, I, I think that's. I think that's wonderful. So I wanted to, I didn't think it would be appropriate to upload a video with um, what I'm going to be talking about and what's happening in this video. Obviously we're talking about the Battle of Hastings. There's an awful lot of violence. There's a lot of death and there's the death of the King. And I felt it was, it wasn't appropriate to upload a video mentioning all of that after we had just had the, the death of the Queen. So I made that, that decision. And um, But let me know how, how are you coping? Oh, it's brought up a lot of emotions. For me personally, it has. I, I have to admit, I, my, um, I've been up and down this week a bit. With my emotions a bit like a yo-yo, I've, I've lost people in my life. I unfortunately lost my mum at a too younger age. You know, I would have loved more time with her. But And all of us has lost someone and I think this has sparked a lot of emotion. And it's that weird feeling, even though most of us never met her and a lot of us don't know her, but there's still that, that loss of someone that constant always there so if you are struggling if you're going through something whether it's through this or something else i am sending you all a massive hug okay so enough rambling let's get on with today's video today is the final part the three parts so go and watch the other two first before you watch this one and this is the final part of harold godwinson and the battle of hastings so Harold Godwinson was now king and poor Edith got completely pushed to the side here is like mm, thanks little sis love you but ta -da. and Harold he made the bold move 
straight away and he expelled all of the Norman monks in Sussex. And Howard was crowned by Archbishop Aldred of York. Archbishop Strigand was excommunicated at this point and he had no authority to perform a coronation. And also Aldred was Northumbrian. So Howard made that point of having a Northumbrian archbishop to do his coronation. And obviously because he was treading very carefully with Northumbria after everything what Tostig had just done. And he also had both Earls Morcar and Edwin there at the coronation and neither of them opposed Howard of being king. And after the coronation, Howard then went to Northumbria along with Bishop of Worcester and Howard held a council and he seeks their consent and he promised that he would rule out wickedness and he would bring peace and promote justice throughout the kingdom. So Northumbria, with their little rumblings, they accepted Howard as king. So over in Normandy, William was out hunting when a messenger informed him that Howard had been crowned king. William went quiet and he looked down. He started to fuss with his clothing and everyone around him fell silent too. William returned to his palace and he sat in his hall. He didn't go to his chambers, he didn't go anywhere else. He went straight to his hall and he sat there and he held his head in his hand and in pure anger more than anything else and no one dared speak to him when he went silent and William had a temper and they knew to be silent when he fell silent and William wrote to Howard he expressed his sadness over the death of King Edward and how he was promised the throne of England and he then offered Howard to marry his daughter and for Howard to give William half of England and or if Howard refused to do any of this then William will invade but there's no surviving letters from either side but in the Norman Chronicles it's stated that Howard was the one who wanted war and he had sent his sister to marry one of William's nobilities. This is the only account that states that. All the other records highly praised Howard Godwinson. And why would Howard want to marry William's daughter when he was already married? Technically, it wasn't seen as a marriage by the English church because it was a Danish ceremony. So she was more his concubine. And that was Edith Swanneck. And they had five children together. They had been together for a very long time. And their relationship was one out of love. It wasn't a political one. So over in Flanders, Tostig, he was still really peeved at his brother. So when he found out that Howard was now king, he um, said to Howard, can you end my exile now? And Howard was like, uh, no, you're staying exactly where I know where you are. And if, Northum if, if Tostig was to come out of his exile, Northumbria would start an all out war and Howard had just seeked peace with Northumbria. So Tostig, he grew restless and he got a few ships and he set off and he recruited pirates and then he headed to Normandy. And in Normandy, William was planning his invasion and he was, begin he was beginning to have warships built. And he wanted to take horses on these ships. 
Now the Normans, they fought really well on horseback. They was um, able to control their horses so well that they didn't need to hold the reins when they fought in battle. They could have their shield and their sword or battle axe, whatever they had in this. And they were able to control the horse with their legs. So I can kind of see William's point, but then his men were around and going, you really want to take horses across the English Channel? You know, with all of that men as well? So they were starting to question William. And William was putting more and more pressure on his men. And not even William's own men thought that um, he had actually been named as heir. So when they said, well, where's this letter that Edward sent you saying that you're his heir? He's like, well, I had it somewhere. I must have lost it. I'll find it out. It's got to be around here somewhere. So Tostig came to court and he had the nerve to shame William in front of his own men. He stated that William had allowed Howard to take the throne and Howard was a liar and William had let him get away with it. And Tostig told, Will told William what to do, that he was to invade England and to put Tostig back as the Earl of Northumbria. Why would William invade England just to put Tostig back as the Earl of Northumbria. So William, obviously, he said, no, that's not going to happen. And he actually let Tostig leave the court peacefully. So William was struggling to get enough men um, together to invade England. So William went to Pope Alexander II and William wanted to call Howard illegitimate to the throne and William the rightful heir to the throne. He stated that Howard was a tyrant and he was disturbing the Christian peace. There's no one was pleading Howard's case, but it's quite possible that England wasn't yet notified. And the Pope, he had no say in who can or cannot be the King of England. That was down to the Witan, and the Witan had chosen Howard Godwinson. But the Pope blessed William's endeavour and he provided him with the papal banner and a sacred ring that allegedly contained a relic from St. Peter so William could wear during the battle. Then in April 1066, Halley's Comet flew through the sky and in the deeply religious people in the 11th century, they saw this as a warning sign from God. In the Isle of Wight, Tostic Godwinson had landed with an army. The islands held meaning to um, the Godwins family. This was the island they all um, united as a family after the exile. And the locals quickly gathered a Dame Goud to give to Tostig to leave in peace. And with that, he and his pirates left. But he went on ravaging along his way, the southern port cities. So in London, King Howard knew that William was building ships and how the Pope now supported him. Howard was now trying to gather a fleet, but Howard was left without a great fleet as King Edward had failed to pay money to maintain that fleet. He allowed it to rot and decay. Edward had failed to pay the taxes for the royal fleet, so it lapsed. Howard did have his own personal ships, but it was nowhere near enough. And um, Howard, he was left scrambling. He was desperately 
trying to build a navy and thanks to Edward, he had hardly anything. So William was building a navy and he had a lot of support, but not all of that support come from Normandy. A lot of it was from Flanders and Brittany and even bishops and priests were um, joining his army. And now Howard's brother, Tostig, is heading towards Kent and Tostig just ravaged everywhere by the sea coast where he could land. There was a lot of wealthy towns along that coast and most of it being England's part-time navy was also along that coast. Romney, Dover, Sandwich, Tostig hit them all. Tostig was destroying what very little navy Howard had left and his men, so Harold and his men marched to Kent and Tostig was in Sandwich when he was informed that his brother was coming. So Tostig and his pirates set sail and instead of sailing back to Flanders so Tostig could be back with his wife and children, Tostig went north and he reached the land at Humber and Tostig wanted revenge on Northumbria. Tostig and his men completely savaged the borderlands between um, Mercia and Northumbria. Tostig had just took his fleet between the earldoms of his two enemies, Edwin of Mercia and Morcar of Northumbria. He did this to get a response and Tostig was majorly outnumbered though Earl Morcar and Edwin along with their armies joined and they quickly drove Tostig out and Tostig's pirates they'd also had enough of him so a lot of them left and he was left with only a very few men and Tostig still didn't return home to Flanders he instead set sail to Scotland. Howard was still desperately trying to bring together land defences and navy. He managed to bring together a naval fleet and had them assembled at the Isle of Wight. It was recorded in the um, Anglo-Saxon Chronicles that his navy was of around three to four hundred ships. Now we're not told how he actually managed to get all of those ships. William's fleet was of around 700 ships and he wasn't ready until the 12th of August in 1066. Even though he said he wasn't ready to set sail because of bad weather, but William knew that Tostig was planning something. And the Bayo Tapestry stated that it was bad weather because William said it was bad weather. And there generally was bad weather, but that wasn't until a month later. Tostig, he had no luck in Scotland with King Malcolm. King Malcolm didn't really want to know. So Tostig set sail once again. This time he went to Denmark to King Swain and he seeked the support to make war with his brother and once again King Swain he wasn't interested and he even tried to persuade um, Tostig to drop this pointless feud with his brother just end it. He even offered Tostig a place at court but Tostig wouldn't have none of it. So Tostig left Denmark, well, Swain's court anyway, and um, Tostig was quickly running out of options. So he turned to the only person he could think of, a man who was a real force to be reckoned with. He was a fighting warrior who was recorded to be extremely tall handsome, muscular. 
he was kind of like your Viking version of Jason Momoa. You know? That Viking warrior was Howard Hardrada. Now, I was not sure where or when Tostig and Howard actually met. There's also some confusion over what happened between the two, but Howard agreed to invade England with Tostig and the two planned their invasion and they began building an army and Howard built his army much quicker than William had and Hadrada had his son Magnus appointed as regent whilst he was away. Now King Howard Hadrada launched his fleet on the 12th of August 1066, the same day William had originally planned to set sail from Normandy. Now, Howard Hardrada sailed and landed at Orkney and to rest up and to recruit more for his army. A month later in Normandy on the 12th of September, William and his generals set sail for England. But William's fleet was generally tackling high winds and the ships were getting blown around, some were smashed into the rocks and some were lost. Some got turned around and went further out to sea and then the rain hit. William's army were either dying or they were lost at sea and William lost around a hundred ships and we're not told of the amount of men or horses that were lost. But the bad weather continued and the remaining fleet that managed to survive the bad weather continued on their course. Now in Orkney, Hardrada had virtually doubled his army. He landed at Cleveland, which I don't think it exists anymore. I don't think. And he raided it and moved on about 45 miles to Scarborough. Now Scarborough wasn't happy to see the invading Norse army so Scarborough built a defence system and they hid behind their walls and they knew they were no match against Hardrada and his army. So Hardrada told his men to build a fire after all, the houses and the walls were built out of wood. And Scarborough quickly caught fire. And Scarborough surrendered to Hardrada. But he wasn't going to stop there. Scarborough was to suffer terribly at the hands of Hardrada. And he continued south. Hardrada was having many more locals surrendered to him, some even supported him and he, as he was sailing up the Ouse in Yorkshire, the sight of the Norse invasion must have been pure, completely terrifying. Hardrada was heading straight for farmlands and innocent people were losing everything again. Hardrada landed at Brickle, about a three mile, um, three mile march to York. Earl Morcar was only about 15 and he was being tasked to bring forces together. His brother Edwin was with him and Edwin was only around 18 or 19 and he had his forces from Mercia and the two young inexperienced brothers were about to go up against the fighting warrior Howard Hardrada and Tostig Godwinson. On the 20th of September, it was a Wednesday, it was recorded that it was a Wednesday, Hardrada's army marched onwards to York and he took about 6,000 men with him. The rest he left remaining at the ships. He chose this battlefield when he was a mile out of York, he chose a flat piece of land wedged between a river on the west and a swamp on the east. 
there's been a lot of speculation whether this was the actual spot Hardrada chose. But Hardrada placed his most experienced fighters, including himself, against the river. His less inexperienced fighters were by the swamp. Then both Morcar and Edwin left the fortified town of York and headed towards the Norseman army along with their forces. The boys weren't experienced and Hardrada used that to his advantage. Most of the English forces were drowned or they fled or they were killed. And it was said that the amount of men in the swamp, the Norsemen were able to walk across without getting their feet wet. The boys had survived their first, their first battle barely, they barely survived. And King Harold Hardrada turned his attention to the ancient city of York. York surrendered to Hardrada. They even delivered hostages and provisions to their new lord. And on Sunday the 24th, King Hardrada and Tostig Godwinson and the Norse army took procession of the north. In York, Howard Hardrada entered the city. He had only had Tostig and his personal guard with him. The rest of his army was outside the city walls. Hardrada was extremely confident. So much so he entered the city peacefully. Hardrada had called for a meeting that he had called a thing. And Tostig was there whispering in his ear and hostages were offered, mostly children. They then left and returned to their ships and they had plans to finish up the next day. Now King Harold Godwinson, his forces were growing. He had between 10 and 12,000 men and they reached Todcaster. Todcaster, Todcaster. He was now 10 miles from York and the sun was starting to settle, it was too late to battle. And Hardrada was still none the wiser that Harold Godwinson was on his way. And the English were exhausted, so they rested. And on Monday, the 25th of September, Hardrada woke on his ship, ready to administer his new kingdom. And the meeting spot was seven miles east of York at a crossing called Stamford Bridge. Then it was probably been marching around 15 miles from their ships. So Hardrada was going to camp and his army there, they still had no idea that Howard Godwinson and his forces was on their way. So Hardrada left for Stamford Bridge but he had left behind around 3,000 men um, to stay with the ships, including Hardrada's son, Olaf. The others went forward onto Stamford Bridge. And in that year of 1066, there was really weird weather throughout the whole year. And in September, they had a really unusual, very, very hot heat wave. Oh, like, it's kind of like what we had this year. And for September, it was very unusual and it was hot. So Howard Hardrada told his men of around five or 6,000 to bring their helmets and their shields and their weapons but leave their heavy coats and their chain mail behind they wasn't going to need it after all they were only going to have a little meeting and they would be much more comfortable walking their 15 mile walk in the extreme heat now Howard Godwinson he was marching to York and he called up his house carls now, these men were taught to fight from a young age. The housecarls were physically and mentally trained for this. 
they were infamous. Even Hadrada had heard of them. One of his advisors had warned him of their skill. He was told that just one house carl was equal to multiple Norsemen warriors. And in battle, these house carls, they're kind of like the Anglo-Saxon version of SAS. I say SAS because I'm Herefordian, so. It was said that Howard was well received in York and he kept on marching. He marched through York and out of York and the English were now only seven miles away from Stamford Bridge. Howard Hardrada and his men were at Stamford Bridge and not many locals turned up to the thing and there were reports that no fewer of 500 hostages handed over mostly children not given half of what they were expecting and suddenly there was a cloud of dust just over the hill and that was down from um gate helmsley now tostig he told Hardrada, oh it's my supporters they've come to support me this is great you know i've actually got people who want to support me then he saw the shields and the armour and the horses and then he saw his brother. Oops. King Harold II of England was coming to tell his brother off. The Norse army was split into two and they were unarmed. Now Tostig had begged Hardrada to retreat back to the ships to link up the with the rest of the army and get their weapons and come up with a plan and Hardrada in that moment kind of gave Tostig that look and going you really know what I thought you were. So Hardrada ordered three of his fastest riders to go straight back to camp and to tell the remaining men to armour up and head straight back to Stamford Bridge. He will stay and he will try and slay as many men as he could until his reinforcements arrived. Hardrada had years of experience and this wasn't his first battle. On the north side of the bridge, part of the English army on horseback had slammed into the unprotected and lightly armoured Norsemen. Hardrada had immediately pulled back his remaining forces on the south of the side of the Derwent. He would use the bridge as a bottleneck to reduce the impact of the English. Now reports had said that as the Norsemen retreated, one warrior stayed behind, standing at the centre of the bridge and he howled it. It was said that the English tried to break through using um, long range weapons such as javelins and arrows, but the warrior stayed upright. He was either extremely agile or his um, shield was very thick. A hundred years later, it would be written that the English charged the bridge and the lone warrior killed dozens of them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But whatever happened, it gave Hardrada that time he needed to get a proper look at the scale and the size of what he was facing. But Hardrada's main concern were the horses. The cavalry horses could charge in quickly and retreat and do it again and again and again and again. So as the lone wolf warrior held the bridge, Hardrada told his men to weather the English force. They needed to hold until his reinforcements arrived. The chronicles stated that an Englishman waded through the Derwent, stopping under the bridge, and he impelled the mighty warrior from below. 
and once that warrior was down, the English army swarmed across the bridge, fanning out onto the southern bank. Hardrada had been caught out by surprise, but this didn't really hold him back. He raised his men into a circle, a circle that was equally thick all the way around. And they were standing shoulder to shoulder, shield to shield. And they were prepared to stand a charge from any direction. And in the center of the ring were the Norse archers. And that is where Howard Hardrada himself would go, but not just yet. Hardrada's army still needed orders and they needed their commander, Hardrada. So he put on his coat of mail and this coat was really long. It went to his mid leg and it was so thick that he had never been pierced. And his coat also had a name, Emma. So Hardrada had Emma on his back and he got on his jet black war horse and he rode around his circle of men. Hardrada told his men they would hold off the English. He told them they will withstand the pounding attacks of the cavalry that he knew would be coming. And the first row of fighters defending the circles planted the base of the, the, the spears into the ground with the tips high enough to take out the horses. And the second row would hold their spears level, ready to take out both men and horses. And this wasn't the first time Hardrada had faced a cavalry. This was Howard Hardrada, a fearless Viking warrior. He had faced countless battles in many different lands and he had faced armies like this before at home in the east and now here in the west so he was sparring on his men he was rallying up ready to go and ready to fight and howard hardrada he fell off his horse and i'm not even joking it's recorded he fell off his horse Howard Hardrada wasn't a young man anymore. He was in his 50s. And he had lived a long and hard life. But Hardrada didn't think that time and age applied to him. So a smaller force of English warriors was sent on horseback to circle around the Norse line and to harry them but the hold of the Norsemen made it impossible for the riders to break through. They could make a direct attack on the lines, but it would be suicide. And the archers in the circle were gradually taking them out. Um, but this wasn't Howard Godwinson's cavalry. Well, it was his cavalry, but it wasn't his full on army. This was just a small detachment. And eventually, Howard Godwinson's full army took their shields and engaged the Norse. They slammed directly into the thick of shields and spears. And they did it again and again and again. And the Norse were desperately clinging onto their shields, trying to hold the line. Those three riders Hardrada sent off at the beginning, they had finally made their way back to the um, camp. And they screamed that the king was in trouble and Stamford Bridge was a trap. And now they were heavily outnumbered by an enemy army. The remaining men wasted no time in gathering their weapons and putting on their armour and they ran as fast as they could to Stamford Bridge which was 15 miles away. Hardrada was doing whatever he could to just hold his line until his reinforcements arrived. But it could take hours. And there isn't a moment by moment account of this battle, only that it was long and that it involved almost 20,000 men. 
a lot of historians today say that it would be equivalent to um battle of trafalgar he would hold that um greatness of a war if that's such a thing to say so it was extremely hot they all the men began to get they was exhausted anyway but they really began to suffer and it was showing the Norse wall began to weaken but the English also began to break and a chunk of the English line began to retreat and the Norsemen took this advantage and they surged forward they were going to end it now and they did it at Forcefield Gate but that army was led by two inexperienced teenage boys and farmers this was Howard Godwinson a very experienced warrior he didn't just have farmers in his army he also had house cows, a lot of them and what they made Hardrada and his push um men think it was a retreat was actually a feint and now through their army pushing forward there was a hole in the Norse wall and suddenly a surge of javelins drav and arrows th flew through the air and in an instant their wall began to shatter. Now was the time for Harold Hardrada to show why he was so famous. He threw, us, threw off his armour Emma was down to the floor and he had his two-handled sword in his hands and he drove straight into the centre of the fight in his personal guard desperately trying to keep up with him and Hadrada was face to face with the house cows. He pounded the English horses. The attack was so fierce there was a song about it. Quote, Where Battlestorm was winning, when our cloud was singing, Howard is there of armour bare, his deadly sword still swinging. The foemen feel its bite, his Norsemen rush to fight, danger to share with Howard there, where steel on steel was ringing. Then suddenly, an arrow struck Howard Hardrada in the throat and he hit the ground hard and his men soon began to fall around him. The English halted their attack and they offered the Norsemen peace and both armies were exhausted. The English could defeat the army but many more lives would be lost. So Howard Godwinson pleaded with his brother who was now bearing the banner as Land Ravenger. Howard promised him that he and his men would be given quarter and peace. Let's just stop this now. But if Tostig was thinking of accepting, he didn't have the chance. The Norse army were screaming. They told King Howard that they would rather die one by one then accept quarter from the English. They said their bodies would form a corpse ring around um, Hadrada, protecting him even in death. And the Norse howled and they launched themselves back into battle. There's nothing to say how long the fighting went on for after, but as evening approached, Hadrada's reinforcements arrived and they found their army slaughtered, Land Ravenger had fallen, and it was a bloody field of carnage, and in front of them was their fallen king, Harold Hardrada. They took the English by surprise, they linked up with the remaining Norsemen, but they too were exhausted, and they were barely standing, and they weren't even holding their shields. Some of them simply fell to the ground of extreme exhaustion 
and eventually the Norse gave up. Those that had survived fled the field and they went back to the ships to where Hardrada's son Olaf was waiting. They boarded their ships carrying their fallen king. Hardrada was, well, would be buried um, next to his half-brother Saint Olaf. This once great invasion fleet that was reported to have been around 300 ships full of Viking warriors was now completely broken. Only 24 ships made sail with only around 500 men of Hardrada's army survived. There was a archaeology um, remains found at Rickall that was likely to be the Norse mooring site and they found skeletons of men um, who suffered battle wounds. Back at Stamford Bridge, the it had remained easily identifiable um, as late as the 12th century. It was recorded that a mountain of dead man's bones still lie there that bears witness to the terrible slaughter on both sides. And among those who died, was Tostig Godwinson. It's not known when or how he fell or who even killed him, but as they were clearing the battlefield of the dead, thousands of dead, um, the remains, they came across the body that matched Tostig's build and frame. And when they saw he had a mole between the shoulder blades, they knew they had found Tostig Godwinson. The man who had brought all of this devastation upon them but he was still the king's brother and Tostig was buried at York Minster probably on the commands of Harold. Harold Godwinson and his remaining army left to York um, left York to return to London and it was along the way that a messenger reached him he told Harold that another invasion had just landed. This time it was William of Normandy. William was heading for Pevensey, which was nine miles from Hastings, and William's invasion hadn't gone to plan. There was bad weather, there was a lack of supplies, and supplies they did have, William was eating his way through them. And as William's fleet headed closer to Pevensey, riders from Pevensey rode as fast as they could to the king. As William and his men were disembarking, William actually slipped and he landed face first into the sand. Now his men gasped and thought, God, you know, he's just planted himself face first into the sand. And but William grasped the sand through both his hands and he said he was grabbing England with both hands. Now if this was true it was a pretty good move on William's part as this was the exact same thing that Julius Caesar had done when he invaded England. So William unleashed his um, soldiers onto the town. They slaughtered cattle, sheep, pigs and they were all cooked up and they pillaged whatever they wanted they took the supplies the villagers needed to survive the oncoming winter and William was insistent that he was the rightful godly king and Howard Godwinson was the usurper he was the he was there to save the people from the unruly tyrant king but what did William do as soon as he landed? He immediately attacked those people he was supposedly there to save. The truth was, Howard Godwinson was not an usurper and William was not the true heir to the English throne. There's a reason why William is called William the Conqueror. So as King Howard Godwinson and his men were heading back 
to London, the news hadn't reached him that William had landed at Pevensey. But news had reached William's camp of Howard's success at Stamford Bridge, William now realised that he wasn't going up against Howard Ardrada, he was in fact going up against Howard Godwinson. William had now ordered his men to go to go all out destruction. There was no purpose for it, it was just downright cruelty. And his men had fun. William's men had left Pevensey in complete destruction. A rider now finally reached Howard Godwinson, who told him of William's destruction and pillaging and capturing men, women and children. King Howard sent out summons for more men to join him to go to battle again. This time it was against William the Bastard. Howard and his brothers Gerth and Leo Fine um, uh, with him along with his house Carls and the remaining men rode on to London and as hard and as fast as they could but they were still days away from London and it would be days to reach Hastings and in that time William was continuing his destruction he was building fortifications at Pevensey and there was slavery and just, just cruelty. William stayed there. He hadn't moved on to seize more towns and villages. William, William settled by the port and is unsure why he had actually done this. William settled, um, it could um so we you know we could keep his ships safe and hastings also allowed him to keep an eye out for any hostile ships and hastings it was full of swamps and of course it had the ocean and it did make it difficult for an army to get to but it also kept lines of communication to normandy open and for fresh troops to land in the future. William, who was about 40, he was an experienced warrior, but in Normandy, nothing on this scale and nothing like Howard Godwinson had just faced at Stamford Bridge. Howard Godwinson was moving fast. Only his experienced riders were able to keep up with him. The others, they would just have to catch up. They were running on pure adrenaline. And even though they were all exhausted, Howard had 1,200 men with him at Stamford Bridge, well, remaining from Stamford Bridge. Howard desperately needed those reinforcements and he could only just hope they would reach him in time. At some point, King Howell sent messengers to William's encampment. Um, the King's messenger told William that England was Howard by right. It was granted to him by King Edward on his deathbed and it was witnessed. William was also told that if he refused to withdraw, then all friendship with Normandy will be broken and all the responsibility of those consequences will be William's. William replied to Howard when he arrived in London. Howard was told that William insisted that the king surrender the throne and his kingdom as he, William, was the one true heir of King Edward. And if Howard won't abdicate, the throne then it will be settled by arms and when Howard was told of William's reply he apparently went pale and he simply said we march to battle. Howard went to church at Waltham Church the Holy Cross he prayed um, at Waltham and Waltham Church wasn't just any church to Howard he had rebuilt this church and he invested a lot of time and treasure 
into the church. The church with its mysterious cross had a long history of miracles and the legend says that the reason why Howard loved this church so much was that when he was a child he had suffered paralysis and he believed that it was when he was praying at this cross that it had cured him and he was now hoping that he would receive one last miracle. Howard's summons was being answered. Hundreds of ships were ready to set sail, full of soldiers. What was worrying Howard was his and his army's exhaustion. His brother Gerth advised Howard to slow down, rest, at least until more reinforcements arrived. But Howard refused, so his brother changed tactics. And if this is true, it's, it's just heartbreaking. He, Gerth said to Howard, let me go in your place. Because he had experience in battle. After all, he was beside Howard at Stamford Bridge. And he also said that because he had never met William, he wasn't bound to him. So he couldn't be accused as an oath breaker. Gerth also said, which is a truly heartbreaking bit, it made sense to have him go because if he died, it wouldn't really matter. But if Howard died, the kingdom would be lost. And Howard wasn't the only one who had just lost a brother in battle. Gerth was begging to let him go. So he, Howard, would be safe. But Howard was the older brother. He wasn't going to let his little brother face William of Normandy alone. So they agreed that all three brothers would go and face William together. Howard, Leofine and Gerth. But there was someone else also pleading with Howard to not go. And that was his mother, Gertha. She had already lost so much. She had lost her husband. She had lost two of her sons. And was she really going to let her last three remaining sons face William in battle? She begged Howard to stay, um, to not go. And for a moment, just a brief moment, Howard forgot himself. He had kicked his own mother. This was a man who was grieving, who was exhausted and he was under extreme pressure. Just for that brief moment, he forgot himself. The true battle of Hastings is lost to history. If there was someone who witnessed the battle taking account, of what really happened and it no longer exists. If it did exist, it would only give a partial understanding of the event. The event itself is too big, is too chaotic, and it's so overwhelming that even an eyewitness to give a full, un full understanding of what really happened next. We don't have that, but what we do have is from the Normans and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. And the Chronicles give us very little. They just wrote down who, when, foul, and the Norman records were written in the 12th century, long after the battle. There is no surviving records of the Battle of Hastings from the English point of view. There is too many contradictive accounts of what really happened and the only ones left to tell us the story are of the Normans and their allies. But even they can't get their stories right. They can't agree if Hastings was a large battle or 
um, that involved tens of thousands or a much smaller fight on a hill. They disagree over the soldiers, over the archers, who, when, how and people were killed, trying to figure out the battle, where the battle actually took place, is hard. The land has changed so much over a thousand years. The whole battle is controversial and open for debate. You could read 10, 20 books all about the Battle of Hastings, but you would never read the same battle more than once. So all we can do is read through those remaining sources and just have a guess at what happened. So on Monday, the 12th of October in 1066, King Howard II of England rode out of London. With him was his brothers Gareth and Leo Fryne, his nephew Hakon, who William had released, also joined him. And there was priests from his church at Waltham, abbots, his house carls, thanes, and more that had managed to join him. Howard said, may the Lord now decide between William and me. Before he left, he ordered his royal fleet to assemble at Sandwich, then head on to Sussex and to trap William at Hastings. The problem was William was already aware that Howard was back in London. The element of surprise was gone. So Howard sent messengers telling the reinforcements to make their way to not to make their way to London, but instead meet at a local landmark that was known in the region. Their only hope is that they got there so quick that they caught William off guard. And Howard and his men faced a 60 mile march carrying their heavy armour, shields and weaponry. And they will be walking over uneven roads. And they were doing this on top of the 500 mile round trip to York and back. As they were getting closer to, to Hastings, Howard and his army could see the full scale horror of what William had brought with him from Normandy. The Normans had been burning villages and farms, slaughtering livestock, enslaving men, women and children. And the extreme devastation and murder had led to an entire population of region dropped for generations. Whole towns had been completely depopulated. And one of those estates was a place called Crowhurst. And it was an estate of Harold's. And that community was completely wiped out. William continued to order his men to completely destroy everything in their path, even as the night fell. Not even night could bring them that sort of peace, well, just some kind of peace. So as dawn broke, the English woke to find more men had joined their army, and so their army had grown overnight. And men from Hampshire, Berkshire, Huntington, Abingdon, Suffolk and Norfolk all answered his call. And on the morning of the 14th of October, more men were joining him, including more house carls. Howard now had an enormous army and he had more come in. William, who sent his army to completely destroy everything around them, now realised realize that they he had made their own trap they would run out of supplies as they had already destroyed everything they were getting blocked in they had no chance of reinforcements to come and william apparently he made an overwhelming speech but no one wrote it down so we don't know what that speech was and they had no choice but to fight and to get for what they had come for William's army was assembling at Harlem Hill, half a mile to the, um, the south. The Bayo Tapestry had them marching in full armour, but usually the armour was carried and put on once at that point, And they had to walk five miles to the battle, carrying their shields and weapons. 
Howard took advantage of the defence on the hill. Those on horses dismantled and they had them at the back of the woods. They then moved into a shield, um, a shield wall of human fortress and Howard had planned a defences battle. And there was only one problem. They were lacking one military defence, the archers. He was getting more men and they were on horseback, but his archers were on foot. And with the lack of archers, they didn't have any options to keep the Normans at bay. Howard's full army arrived even though the lack of archers were in William's favour, England still had a massive army that outnumbered the Norman invaders and the hill was full of heavily armed Englishmen. William had never faced anything like this. They left William with only one option to reach them. William placed his most valuable warriors in the centre and the knights were at the back along with William. The foot soldiers would go first to break down the English human shield. We don't know how he formed his men, but we do know that Howard had his forces into three divisions. He had them placed in an arc. His brother Gerth was to the um, right, his brother Leofine was to the left and Howard was in the centre. The bulk of Howard's fighters were wearing padded um, shirts with um, leather armour covered in metal rings and they were armed with spears and carrying wooden shields. And he would have had his more experienced soldiers like his thanes and his house um, household spread throughout the placement in the units would help hold the lines and fight together. The experienced soldiers wore coats of mail on top of padded shirts and they wore helmets, carried shields and they were armed with swords, uh, battle axes and spears and a few carried a weapon called a bill and it was a weapon with a hook blade and these were Howard's main soldiers and they would have been quite the intimidated sight in front of the army down at the bottom of the hill. And at the bottom of that hill were ditches. Now it's unsure if the ditches were already there or if Howard had them dug out. Medieval armies could dig ditches out very quickly. William's army had not only included Normans, but there was also men from Brittany, France and Maine. And it's thought that both armies had between five and 7,000 men. And at 9 a.m. on the 14th of October, 1066, the battle commenced to the terrible sound of the trumpet on both sides. Both sides, the landscape open, enough to allow both armies to manoeuvre the slopes. They were scrubby, they were grazing land, the ridge occupied by King Harold Godwinson and his army backed by the forest. Howard and his army needed to stay behind their shield and the Normans had to climb the slope first, getting over the ditch to reach the English army and fracture them with the archers. Then the infantry and the cavalry could ride through and finish off the remaining remnants of that army. Howard's forces withheld the first wave of William's army. Um, the English with their battle axes cleaved the Norman shield and armour and William regrouped his forces. But then a rumour began to circulate William's army that William was down, their duke had been killed and some of his men began to flee and panic and the English took advantage and they began to pursue them down the hill. Then suddenly they saw William of Normandy right in front of them and he raised his helmet showing his face and he shouted, look at me, I live and with God's help I shall conquer. 
His troops surrounded the pursuing English forces in a successful counter charge on a hillock and they completely annihilated them. For the Norman, the immediate crisis had passed. Throughout the rest of the day, the Normans were continuing their attacks on the English, um, the shield wall, and at least twice they had pretended to flee. Um, the battle encouraging the English to break ranks and pursue them, and they had some success, but the English still held their line, and the hillside was slippery with blood and littered with bodies and discarded and broken weapons and arrows and the extreme tiredness, the hunger, the fear of the surviving warriors and the commanders shouting to rally the exhausted forces. By now the autumn daylight was fading and each side had lost high numbers in their armies. Howard just needed to hold out a little while longer whilst his reinforcements were coming. He just had to hold out. Howard had almost certainly lost his brothers and possibly his nephew and many of his finest warriors. He just needed to hold out until nightfall. He had reinforcements coming. William didn't. The Normans made one final effort to take the regiment and in that came the decisive moment. In that final assault, a single arrow struck Howard Godwinson in the right eye. It didn't kill him. What killed Howard was four of William of Normandy's knights. They surrounded England's fallen king and they hacked him to death. The Norman knights pierced Howard's heart with their swords. They decapitated him and had a sword thrust into his stomach and the fourth knight hacked off his leg below the thigh. King Howard II had died in the most horrendous way. He had lost all of his brothers. He led his men courageously fighting in two battles in a matter of days. Their king was dead and they lost their hope and the Normans began one last fierce assault and the English forces finally gave way and fled but the Normans pursued them, killing them. The battle was over after nine hours, nine long hours since the fighting began. The victory at Hastings was for the Normans and William of Normandy, now William the Conqueror. William completely transformed England from how it was governed, organised, right up to the language. The laws and customs and most visibly today is the architecture. A wave of castles was built across England William had Battle Abbey built on the site of the battle to atone for the carnage of the conquest. And still to this day, no one knows where Howard is buried. Howard's mother, Gaitha, had begged William to tell her so she could give her son the proper burial that he deserved, but William refused. According to an early legend, the high altar in the abbey was placed on the very spot where Howard's body had been found and on William's orders and at Waltham Abbey a life-size statue of Howard Godwinson stands over the churchyard. His broadsword points the way round to the south side of the church and there is a grave. The stones were placed in the 1960s at a memorial and the inscription reads, Howard is King of England, Obet 1066. This stone marks the position of the altar behind the King Howard, who is said to have been buried 1066. A local legend says Howard's body was brought back to Waltham Abbey and he was buried beside the Holy Cross that had meant so much to him. His remains may still be there, 
um, even though the church is gone and the tomb and the side of the high altar is open to the elements the holy cross was supposedly who was supposedly had mysterious um powers had disappeared without trace over 500 years ago and no one knows for certain if Howard's remains really are there the abbey meant so much to him so it's quite possible that he did want to be buried there there has been so many calls for scans or even to have his grave um, ex excavated um, since the discovery of King Richard III under a car park in Leicester. King Howard II of England died aged around 45 years old. He left his wife Edith Swan Neck and five children and it's uncertain if the Godwin's name lives on today. I did try to have a look to see if the Godwin family name remains, but I really couldn't find anything. And that's that. And that's all done. I just think it's, if you could hold out just for one more, half, just half an hour, if you could just hold out just for that pesky arrow, you would never know what would have happened. But there we are. I'm not quite ready to leave the Anglo-Saxon period yet. So I'm not going to dive straight into the Norman period. I've still got an, maybe two more videos I would like to do in the Anglo-Saxon period. And then I will dive straight into the Norman period. And there we are. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please do like and subscribe so you don't miss any future videos and so we also we can reach more and more history lovers like yourselves. Look after yourselves, take care and I'll see you all soon.